What's up, it's Peñuel the Black Pen. Uh, first protocols, of, of course. Uh, I'm visiting the very beautiful city of Durban. Uh, I normally come here for business and also to see my kids, Ushaga, who is my third born son, and Kalchi, Unkanyezi, who is my second daughter. Um, I'd like to just thank, man, all the people that have been very hospitable to me in Durban. Uh, people like Tutuzani Zuma, Winston Innes, uh, Mondi Ngobo, uh, an amazing uh, musical maestro. Uh, people like Oliso, uh, who hosts me here. And uh, re uh, recently, um, I've now befriended Usandi Leshez, <laughs> who you guys know as a Forex guru. Um, and so many other people in Durban that have been so hospitable to me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to build more relationships with some of the people in Durban. Could be business people. Uh, it could be people in the political space. Um, it could be people in the activism and social work space. People that are doing charity work on the ground. People that are trying to uplift and empower Durban. And more than anything, I really hope to build some relationships with some of the Indian people in Durban. Because a big part of the economy of Durban, a big part of the political landscape in Durban is run by Indian people here in Durban. And it's important that many of us that are going to be doing business in Durban get to get very comfortable and very friendly with the Indian population in Durban. I've bumped into so many Indian people at places like the Pavilion and Gateway who have come up to me and be like, Hey, you're Black Pen, you're the guy on TikTok. Uh, which is pretty dope for me because it, it reminds me that the work I do has a reach that goes beyond black South Africans. Um, white South Africans come up to me, colored South Africans, of course, uh, many Africans on the continent. I've got people that watch my continent around the world, but it is quite heartwarming to see that there are even people from the Indian communities that consume my content, people that are passionate about this country, people that see South Africa as their home. And people that are like, look, we want to work. We want this country to work. We struggle with the same struggles like everyone else. We're frustrated by crime. We're frustrated by potholes and load shedding. We're frustrated by corrupt uh, government officials. And we want to work with people that don't see us as their enemy and as non-South Africans. We are South Africans as much as anyone else. And we want to work together. So I'm hoping to build more relationships with the people in Durban, including the Indian community. Two reasons why I'm making this video. The first one is from something that Ufusi Tembewayo said at the Millionaire's Masterclass uh, business seminar that we had in Malachlin, hosted by Utsepo Mavunja, who is the founder of uh, Zitolama, Cleaning Solutions and Sukasa Burial Estate. Ufusi Tembewayo spoke about first world, second world, third world nations and how so many of us don't even know where these terms come from and what they mean. Um, I found that video very educational. A lot of his videos ensure that they touch on history, economic theory, business theory, and just sometimes just social commentary. Um, that makes a lot of sense and is very relevant. So I went and I did the research. And the first part of today's video is me reading an article for you guys. The second part is going to be a bit of a bitter pill to swallow, but it's directed at black South Africans and maybe black Africans as a whole. But let's start here. History.com is the website. And the title of the article is Why a Country is Classified as First, Second, or Third World. Written by Evan Andrews. Uh, it was originally written on the 23rd of September, 2016. And then it was updated on the 17th of May, 2023. It goes, People often use the term Third World as shorthand for poor or developing nations. By contrast, wealthier countries such as the United States and the nations of Western Europe are described as being part of the first world. Where did these distinctions come from and why do we really hear about the second world? The three worlds model of geopolitics first arose in the mid 20th century as a way of mapping the various players in the Cold War. The origins of the concept are complex, but historians usually credit it to the French demographer Alfred Sauvy, who coined the term Third World in a 1952 article entitled Three Worlds, One Planet. In this original context, the First World included the United States and its capitalist allies in places such as Western Europe, Japan and Australia. The Second World consisted of the Communist Soviet Union and its Eastern European satellites. I think that's very important to highlight. The first world were the capitalist nations, with the second world being the communist nations surrounding mostly the Soviet Union 
and its Eastern European satellites. The Third World, meanwhile, encompassed all the other countries that were not actively aligned with either side in the Cold War. These were often impoverished former European colonies and included nearly all the nations of Africa, the Middle East, Latin America and Asia. I start thinking now of the Russia and Ukraine conflict and how people are being forced to pick sides. You've got the United States on the one side, you've got uh, maybe people that are pro-Russia on the other side, and then you've got the people that are diplomatically sitting on the fence, countries like South Africa currently. And you, you see in the Cold War of the Soviet Union, communist nations were seen as second world, capitalist nations were seen as first world, and then third world was everyone else. Today, the powerful economies of the West are still sometimes described as first world, but the term second world has become largely obsolete following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Third world remains the most common of the original des designations, but its meaning has changed from non-aligned and become more of a blanket term for the developing world. Since it's partially a relic of the Cold War, many modern academics consider the third world label to be outdated. Terms such as developing countries and low and lower middle income countries are now often used in its place. I'm going to drop a link in the description of this article. I think it's, it's quite informative and it should shift some of the thinking because so many of us, sorry, I'm just looking at the lighting. It's coming into my face. Let's try here. So many of us, when we think first world, we obviously think rich countries. So many of us, when we think third world, we think poor countries. And a lot of journalists and people that write articles have kind of played along with that. But to be honest, the origin of the term is first world, the USA, Western Europe, and its capitalist allies, including Japan and Australia. Second world was the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And then third world was everyone who was not aligned. Whether you are capitalist, communist, socialist, it doesn't matter. Today, we need to kind of scrap what first, second, third world is. So first world doesn't mean, oh, we are rich. And third means, oh, you're third in place, therefore you are poor. It was non-aligned. What's more important is developed versus developing nations, of which, of course, a lot of the African nations are developing because of the history of the African continent. Now comes the second part of this video. Like I said, it's going to be a bit of a bitter pill to swallow, but I think it's very important. I've been avoiding the news. I think following current affairs, being abreast of what's happening in the news, in the economy, politically, socially, is very important. But I have found that I struggle to control my emotions. And a lot of the news we have in South Africa, I find very triggering. From stories like the Minister of uh, Electricity, Jose Enzo Ramokhopa, wearing a huge Michael Kors 6,000 Rand sweater on TV, discussing load shedding. To Dr. Nandi Pamakudumana, dressed, looking sizzling in court. Tabo Besta now, wearing a very expensive Louis Vuitton jersey, which people are arguing costs about 23,000 Rand in court, after allegedly scamming so many people in this country. You listen to Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, speaking about the state of electricity, even though he and his ministers are never load shed. You listen to other people speak about the state of this country. Meanwhile, they are kind of exempt from the realities of this country. And a lot of them don't seem to really care. So I normally avoid the news because they trigger me and they gaslight me. But it is important that we pay attention to current affairs and the news. In watching the news yesterday, it's kind of happening what's been trending. Cyril Ramaphosa uh, hosting the leaders of the Netherlands and Denmark. <laughs> raising, I think, a one billion rand, if not one billion dollar green energy fund. When we've got so much coal in this country that we keep exporting while we're dealing with electricity issues. Things that upset me, of course. The issues of Cyril Ramaphosa and other African state leaders going to Poland and Russia to go and try and broker peace <laughs> with nations that would obliterate our countries. I was just reminded of the state of the South African landscape. I've said this and I will say this again. South Africa does not belong to the indigenous South African people. It's been one of the bitter pills I've had to swallow. This country has got beautiful, beautiful landscapes. The mountains, the rivers, the dams that have been built, um, the beaches, um, some of the desert land, uh, 
Various parts of this country are absolutely breathtaking. Globally, there are people that travel the whole world to come and see the beauty of South Africa. And for that, a lot of South Africans, we appreciate it, but it's not really for us. Some of the better parts of South Africa are isolated and ring fenced for tourists. Kruger National Park, parts of Cape Town, etc. The Trockensburg Mountains, Ukashamba. Um, the tourists come here and they enjoy the best parts of this country. The indigenous people don't, and they pay top dollar for that. A lot of these tourist spots are actually not even owned by South Africans. They're actually owned by foreigners. That's the landscape. Then we have our minerals, which is actually what brought all the boys to the yard. Our gold, platinum, copper, uh, etc. I sat with Gaten McKenzie on the panel show, and he was re-highlighting all the commodities we have in this country. We are a world leader in commodities, and he disagrees with me. I believe the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the most resource-rich nation on earth. He believes South Africa is way richer, and there is an intentional move to not ex expose so many of our commodities of which today we arguably have gas and oil deposits which have not been explored people have argued that russia which is the biggest land mass on in in the world russia has a lot of commodities that have not been explored mostly because a lot of the terrain where you need to explore it is in very it's very difficult and complex and it would require a lot of money ice snow mountains etc Anyways, Gaten says we're the wealthiest commodities country in the world. The commodities in this country brought a lot of British people, what we call Afrikaners today, which were a combination, which are a combination of the French, Dutch, German, and other European people that came here. There were a lot of Asians that came here. Some of them brought in as slaves, the Indians that came to work the sugarcane plantations in KZN. Uh, some Malaysians who went to the Western Cape, today called Cape Malays. And so many other foreigners that have come here because of our gold, platinum, diamonds, etc. And we've built places like Gauteng, the place of gold, Johannesburg. Obviously, we've built Cape Town. We've built Durban, Richards Bay, which are important harbors. East London, Port Elizabeth, Tekrabeja. You've got places like the Northwest, the platinum mines. Part of Limpopo, especially because of the fertile land there and some of the game farms there. Mpumalanga with its very rich commodities, coal, uh, etc. Um, and its beautiful landscape as well, the mountains of Mpumalang. You've got the Free State farm, farmland, which is very close to Lesotho and the Lesotho mountains, with the beautiful or the, the amazing mountains and the, and the pure water that comes from there. Lesotho itself has got commodities that have not been explored. Um, the Northern Cape, the Eastern Cape, uh, KZN, of course. I don't know if I forgot any of the provinces. So we've built an economy of our commodities. And from the economy that we've built, there have been ancillary paraphernalia industries that have been built. Our economy, or rather an economy in my opinion, is built from primary sectors. Mining, farming, manufacturing, and construction um, logistics the logistics is obviously the moving of the mine mined goods the farmed goods and then if you're manufacturing or constructing stuff the manufactured goods need to be moved um, for things to be constructed you need to be moving certain commodities etc and then come these other sectors like technology and then you obviously need people and where you need people other sectors like property come up because people need a place to stay Retail comes up because people need clothing to wear, they need food to eat um, and many other sectors from there. You can speak law, you can speak accounting, you can speak banking, you can speak healthcare because people get sick. You can speak education and schooling because people need to send their kids to school somewhere and the kids need to learn skills so that they can be active in the economy. The economy of South Africa Mining, farming, manufacturing, construction, logistics. Big chunk of it is not owned by indigenous South Africans. I'm talking black people. I'm talking the Nguni, Sutu, Twana, Pedi, Chitonga, Chivenda tribes, the Khoi and San. A lot of it is not owned by local indigenous South Africans, black people. A big chunk of it is owned, of course, by 
white South Africans who came here as immigrants because of the commodities. And then, sadly, some of the biggest parts of our economy are owned by foreign nationals, foreign companies from Australia, from Canada, from the United States of America, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, parts of Asia, our economy. And now, you know, I'm going like around an entire bend to get to my point. The indigenous people of South Africa, because this country does not belong to them, almost become a frustration to the people running the economy. So firstly, when you come to build an economy, you realize, look, the people themselves can be a commodity. We will use them. We will make sure that we put them to work in the mines, on the farms, in the factories, etc. And during colonization, the British colonization or colonial era in South Africa, during apartheid South Africa with the Afrikaner government, the black people in this country were used as labor. And they were used as very cheap labor. <laughs> we were the donkeys of the economy. And we worked very well for people to become rich, to become landlords and the like. And as time went by, <laughs> the indigenous people became a bit smart and they were like, no, but we're not getting fair buck, you know, for the work that we're putting in. And activism started. A lot of the black people became educated and started having the mindset of the colonizers where they were like, no, we would like to have high tea. We would like to wear suits. We would like to live in colonial homes. We would like to have fancy cars and travel abroad, etc., etc. And they wanted um, a place at the table. And that's where the uprising came. ANC, 1990, 1994, Nelson Mandela, etc., etc. Today you fast forward and you realize a big chunk of the indigenous South Africans are no longer needed in the mainstream economy. And again, they've become a hindrance. And now... The new landlords, the new black elite, Cyril Ramaphosa, Patrice Mutsipe, Saki Matozoma, Mzi Kumalo, Lazarism, Dr. Anna Mkhokong, um, Bridget Khatebe, Mutsipe, etc. These new, new money, Siponkosi, uh, Putumanchego, so many of them, they've been co opted into the system and they've become rich. And part of the agreement and the negotiation was we will give you power because you, we see you're frustrated. You want to sit at the table. We'll let you sit at the table. But you now need to keep the rest of the blacks at bay. And the negotiations that the ANC and other people led, Thabo Mbegi, Nelson Mandela, Cyril, Jacob Zuma was there, Chris Hani before he was gunned down over there. They were like, look, you guys need to give us something to give these people to calm them down. Free houses, RTP, some grants, social grants today we've gone from 19 million <laughs> we used to have 10 million back in the day to 19 million today we've got close to 30 million grant recipients half of the country is on one or other grant some level of free schooling because this is what we promised the people when we were fighting even though the content of the schooling is very hollow and useless free health care doesn't have to be world-class health care but just enough you know get an injection get some meds when you have a headache etc so that the people can calm down but we're not going to let them be active players in the economy. And much of the colonial and apartheid regulations that existed have not been changed by the ANC government precisely because they realize if we uplift and empower these people, we can't be rich. <laughs> we're going to lose our wealth and our privileges. Imagine Cyril not having the farms that he has, the game farms and the cattle farms and the stunning homes in Johannesburg and Cape Town and probably abroad. Imagine some of these new black people and obviously the old white people not getting to have the mansions and the thousands of hectares of land because now they have to share it with the people they're like nah never that my kids need to carry on going to the most prestigious private schools i need to have a fleet of very expensive cars and i need to live a very comfortable life and maybe even own my own airplane a <laughs> shout out to zunaid morty uh, who owns a, a fleet of airplanes very wealthy local businessman in south africa When I listen to the political rhetoric from the ANC today, the EFF under Julius Malima, I listen to people like Gaten McKenzie at the PA, Herman Mashab at Action SA, John Stian Hazen's Democratic Alliance, the leaders of the IFP, um, Freedom Front Plus, ACDP. They are not having honest conversations with the people they want to vote for them. What is essentially currently happening is because our economy is not 
owned by indigenous South Africans and is owned mostly by foreigners. The people that are entrusted to lead the country politically are not doing it for the benefits of the locals. People are essentially campaigning, vote for me to be the caretaker of the welfare of this country. Not lead me so that you can become a, an economic player, locally and globally. <laughs> now, when I look at the state of this country and the people, maybe let's speak load shedding, electricity outages, potholes in the roads, poor education infrastructure for the masses, poor healthcare infrastructure for the masses, even though they, they're looking to introduce the National Health Insurance Bill, NHI, though they failed to build decent hospitals and clinics for the masses. You look at the high unemployment between the mid-30s to high mid-40s, and for the young people in this country, over 70% unemployment. I realize, number one, a reminder, the good infrastructure of this country was not built for the masses. It's one of the conversations I had recently that the reason ESCOM struggles is because the ESCOM infrastructure wasn't built for the masses of South Africa. It was actually built for the white population. Which is fine, it makes sense. These were the people running the economy. Again, black people were a hindrance. Here and there you put what we call Apollo, these huge floodlights in the townships, but nothing really major. The schools as well. The British colonial government, of course, did well for white British people and some Afrikaans people and other white people in this country. When the apartheid government came in, they made sure that they prioritized white Afrikaners. They built schools for them, good quality schools. They built universities, good quality universities. They made sure that white Afrikaners lived in decent home, homes um, and made sure that white Afrikaners got decent jobs. And then they pumped a lot of money into white Afrikaans owned farms and white Afrikaans businesses. Today you've got your Afkri, Sanlam, Absa from Falskas, Naspers, Multi-Choice. Uh, you've got people like your Johan Ruperts, uh, Yanni Mutons, uh, and, and other white Afrikaans business people that have done really well. Christo Visa, of course. The black government that's come in, one would have assumed, as difficult as the task is, because it's a difficult task, it's not like you're looking after an 8% white population. <laughs> you're looking after an 80% black population. You would have assumed that the priority would have been let us, like the apartheid government, prioritize building for the black people. If ESCOM was built for 8% of the population, to reach 80% of the population, you need to multiply by 10. It's basic maths. That means you need to build 10 ESCOMs. One ESCOM for 8%, 10 ESCOMs for 80%. If you're planning to get black people to have cars on the roads, and we know the highways that were built, we're like, okay, that means we need to multiply the roads by 10. Because now black people are going to have roads, the highways need to be expanded, we need to build more roads. If the hospitals and the clinics largely were built for a white population you multiply that by 10 yes it's going to need money but this is where you prioritize based on the economy and you make sure that the economy is inclusive of these black people so that they can pay the tax build the businesses that export and bring foreign currency in so that you have the money to build these things failing which of course you have to downgrade downgrade everything that means if escom was world class you're gonna to have to just make it sort of decent so that it can share power same with the hospitals uh, the clinics, the schools, and make sure that your content of schooling is focused on developing the economy. One of the things that the ANC government failed in dismally, I'm, I'm calling it fail because we assume that they were serving the black masses. Maybe they succeeded because maybe that was not the intention. One of the places they failed in was they were meant to say, look, this is our economy. We mine, we farm, we manufacture, we construct. We do logistics and we need technology. So in schools, we're going to make sure that the children aggressively are being taught farming, aggressively are being taught mining, aggressively are being taught manufacturing, aggressively are learning technology, 
aggressively are learning logistics so that all the kids in this country can become economic players if not in south africa then we can export them to other parts of the world so that they can build in those countries and bring back money here sort of like what johan rupert did building richmond listing it in switzerland but making sure that the dividends were being paid in south africa so that taxes are paid in south africa which is something that he's actively worked to change now because he feels not appreciated in south africa where he says look i'm the biggest taxpayer in the country but you guys don't seem to appreciate the tax money i'm bringing in from overseas by the way shout out to johan rupert he's just come out again as the wealthiest african surpassing aliko dangote of nigeria aliko dangote congrats as well because he's officially opened the refinery a oil refinery i think it's the largest in Africa, if not the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. Shout out to Aliko Dangote, who's been the wealthiest African for the longest time. Generational wealth from the Dantata family, which is his mother's side. Johan Rupert is now again number one. Richmond, luxury goods, bumped up by, I think, over 30% from the beginning of the year. We needed indigenous black South Africans to be economic players so they can build this country and bring foreign currency in. Now, when I listen to political rhetoric and I listen to people complaining about the state of this country, and then I look at the black politicians, I realize black South Africans do not deserve even this current bad country that we have. <laughs> black South Africans do not deserve load shedding, potholes, bad hospitals and clinics, bad schools. Black South Africans deserve worse than that. How you measure a people is you measure them from the spaces they occupy before influence by others. The state of South Africa and Africa before colonizers came in was, was a beautiful paradise and a utopia, arguably. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of the the bad stories are kept at bay. But we lived in nature. You know when you watch the movie Avatar by James Cameron. We lived in nature. We lived with nature. With the animals. Uh, our homes were eco-friendly and green. We lived in mud houses. Huts. Straw huts. Um, we, 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 we ate according to the seasons. So our fruit and our vegetables were seasonal. We were there with our cows and our goats and we'd walk. We were very healthy. We'd walk, we'd run, rich, skin rich in melanin because we were getting kissed by the sun and vitamin D daily. We're, we used herbal meds, organic, what is called organic medicine and remedies today. Herbal remedies, organic medicine. We were healthy. We delivered our own babies. We had some semblance of peace. We didn't have things like depression and anxiety and being stuck in traffic. My understanding is we weren't doing funny things like smoking, um, ingesting a lot of alcohol that was destructive. Sorghum beer, relatively healthy, was drunk. We were living in some kind of utopia, but we were not first world, what's called civilized, etc. Colonizers came. Fast forward to today and here we are. And we believe we are poor, we are struggling, and that's what the rest of the world tells us. The townships were obviously constructed and largely a product of the apartheid government which forcefully took land legally from black people i call it conquered other people say it was stolen i've argued that if it's stolen then go and report it and get it back but you are conquered legally and the townships were born now you look at the state of townships and how badly they've been developed you look at the fact that most townships seem to have over 50 percent if not over 60 percent illegally connected electricity bad waterworks poor quality schooling and the black people that managed to get themselves out of the townships whether it's because of their academic brilliance sporting brilliance maybe they are top entertainers maybe they are politicians they leave and they move into white neighborhoods your favorite black politicians Cyril Ramaphosa, Paul Mashatile, Julius Malima, Floyd Shibambu, um, Buisen Ndlozi, Herman Mashaba, people like Gaten McKenzie, um, your favorite black politicians, Musi Maimani. These people live in the suburbs. They don't live in townships. They live in spaces that have been built by and for white people. And they as the leaders have failed to develop townships, 
And if it's not about developing townships, because like I said, they're an apartheid project. Go and find pieces of land and develop black suburbia. I mean, I think now of Deep Kloof in Santon, I think of Sprayed View in the East Rand of Johannesburg near Fosloras, Foslores. Go and develop those spaces. The state of townships is so bad. The economies in the township are not run by local black people. This is not in black spaces. If you look at the shopping centers that are there, you'll find that some of the properties not owned by local black people in the township. Then you look at the businesses that are normally there. It's normally like a formula. You'll find Capitec, where black people bank. You'll find a ShopRite or a U-Save, which is where black people at the lower LSM buy from. You'll find a liquor, a liquor outlet, which is normally there because when you're miserable and depressed, you want to escape and you escape through booze. Sorry, there's like a bug on my hand. There's a KFC, of course, Kentucky Fried Chicken from America. You'll find a Pep, Crystal Visa built. Great business in Pep and ShopRite. Pep, which clothes black people, especially students because they've got a monopoly on school, school uniform and Mobisal is the most distributed phone in the country from an Indian uh, gentleman. Very amazing businessman. Um, there's normally a hardware store because black people always need to renovate and paint and fix windows, etc. There's like a formula of these shopping centers. It's not owned by local black people in the townships. The small spaza shops, tuck shops, are owned by foreigners, Pakistanis, Somalians, Ethiopians. Not by black South Africans. A big chunk of the welfare that comes into the township is not from tax from black businesses and black employees. It's money taxed on white businesses. It is money taxed on white employees. Because white people really, really earn a lot in this country. I was looking at the data again yesterday. The disparity is mind-boggling. White male professionals earn about 30,000 rand a month on average. White male professionals. Their female, white female counterparts earn about 18,000 rand a month. Big gap between 30 and 18. And this also allows the white man to be able to provide for the white woman. Because he earns more than her. Almost double. And then when you look at the black and black male and female professionals. The black male professional earns about 9,500 per month. And the black female professional earns about 11,000 rand a month. The black male and female under earn from the white female. And the difference, the black female marginally earns higher than the black male. In a space where black men are expected to provide, to send e-wallets, to buy drinks, to pay lobolo, to buy the house. The math doesn't make sense. And this is why you've got black men and women fighting. When you look at the non-professionals, you find the white man, professional, is earning 20,000 rand a month. The white female professional is earning about 12,000 rand a month. 20,000, 12,000. Again, white male, white female, non-professional. The black male professional, Baba. The black male professional is earning 3,500. And the black female non-professional is earning just under 3,000 rand. So the black male earns just a bit more than the black female. Anyways, my point was just that so a bulk of the tax is coming from white people in the black spaces. There have been arguments of white people must leave this country and black people must take over. If you were to remove white people in this country, essentially from what we've seen with our eyes, South Africa would become a township. Because that's the best that black people have built in this country. The best that black people have built in this country is a township. Which means the quality of our homes will be the quality of townships. Because that's the average. I'm not going to speak about outliers. The rich black people that have built mansions. Some of our very learned uh, friends up in Limpopo and Venda who built these mansions. Because they work in places like Johannesburg where they earn well. Shout out to them, but they are outliers. Speak about the average. Because we can see the average white home. The average white home is not a forum. It's not a shack. The average white home is pretty decent. The average white school, even on the lower side, is better than some top black schools in the townships. 
So if white people were to leave this country, South Africa would become a township. And once it becomes a township, it means the quality of our schooling would become like township schools. The quality of our hospitals and clinics would be that. The quality of our businesses, I mean, what black business do you know on average? If we're speaking supermarkets, if we're speaking farms, if we're speaking mines, if we're speaking retail technology, which black businesses do you know? We normally refer to the taxi industry, but that's logistics. That's just transporting black people from the township to the suburbs where they go work for white people. And can it be proven that if black people were to take control of this economy, they'd be able to build it? We've got countries like Nigeria, where a big chunk of the economy is, is run by black people. People like Aliko Dangote, Femi Otedola, Mike Adenuga, and other people, they follow Runcho, who's the wealthiest black woman in the world, I believe, if not the wealthiest woman on the African continent. And you look at how Nigeria looks and the corruption. The more elite black people, including your politicians, refuse to live in black spaces, which says and it screams that they themselves don't believe in the abilities of black people, including themselves. When white Afrikaners got into power, they stayed in white Afrikaner spaces and they built them up. Stellenbos being the prime example. They built them up. Two of the top educational institutions in the country are in Stellenbosch. Paul Ruiz Gymnasium, which is a boys' school. Stellenbosch University, Martis, which is a university. Small town. Then you have to look at your counterparts, Tabumbegi and where he comes from. Jacob Zuma in Kanja. Nelson Mandela coming from Mtata, if not Yakunu. And you ask yourself, why have these people not been able to develop where they come from? At least build a world-class black school and build a world-class tertiary institution and live there and uplift and invest in the entrepreneurs there and say, we will build the space so that when people speak about where we come from, they will say, this is like a Stellenbosch. Cyril Ramaphosa, who I think is from Chawelo in Soweto. Julius Malima from Limpopo. I think Sishiko. As bad as our electricity situation and our roads, etc. are, it is still way better than if black people were to run this country themselves. Black people have not proven that they deserve to live in a developed world, at least developed from a Western sense. And even if you try and tell them, look, go back to the villages and live in the utopia of pre-colonization, they refuse. I mean, obviously people have cell phones now, electricity, hot water in the Giza. You know, people get to watch TV and watch a love. People get to drink a black label. You know, people get to dress up fancy in brands, international brands, if not imported from China. People get to go jiva to a piano. Why would they want to go back to the village? Vusi Tembewayo on the panel show sits down and says, Isita somuntum nyama, umuntum nyama. The black man's enemy is the black man. We speak about self-hate and inferiority complex. I get accused of hating on black people all the time and it's from people that don't understand that I actually passionately love black people and it's why I'm in so much pain and why I wish black people could fucking catch a wake up. Black people refuse to buy from black owned puzzle shops. They come up with all kinds of excuses. Black people refuse to buy from black owned supermarkets. Black people refuse to work for black entrepreneurs and employers. Black people at the upper end, including myself, refuse to live in townships and develop the township. Black people refuse to invest in the education of other black people and, edu and, and develop black people. Those of us who are uppity, myself, don't want to go and develop black spaces. And sadly, <laughs> when we do, you look at the work that I do, sitting and educating black people. Of course, I educated all the other races, but particular black people. I get attacked and bashed. They call the sellout. Afri Forum agent. Rob Hersov's uh, T-boy. When I'm trying to be like, I'm, I'm a young black man. My mom is from Ikvugeni Township. My father's from Popomeni Township. We moved to the township. I was born there. I lived there for five years. I went and I studied and lived in suburbia. 
I made friends with white people, English, Afrikaans, with Indians, Hindu, Muslim, uh, Christian Indians. Uh, I made friends with the Taiwanese community in Newcastle. The people that have helped me build my life have been from so many different races, so many different nationalities, so many different backgrounds. So it's kind of <laughs> disingenuous for me to pretend like I was built and sculpted by the township because I wasn't. So in the way I move, in the English that I speak, and the Afrikaans of Atak Prat, I obviously am not an average black person. But I try to give back. The charity work that I've been doing with the Mamsi Foundation for close to 20 years now, the sponsorships we've made, you know, kids that I've paid school fees for in the township. More than that, the education I try to bring on my platforms. The people that sit, Sfiso Matondo, who's an entrepreneur in construction, the education. Vusi Tembewayo himself, Dutuzane Zuma, the son of ex president Jacob Zuma, Winston Innes, colored gentleman that comes from poverty. I had the prince of pan Africanism and a pro black activist, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. I sit with people like Nklantlalax who's trying to develop Soweto, even though he's a product of an uppity living. The guy was at, I think he was at JP Boys and he was also at uh, St. David's in Inanda. And I'm like, if you're not seeing the work and the education, you've completely missed the boat and you actually deserve nothing. You don't even deserve people like myself trying. I need to stop. Because I can comfortably, like your favorite politicians and black business people, I can disappear. And you'll see me driving a nice car. And you'll see me maybe in a few interviews speak about the business that I do. And I'll make money. I'll live in a nice mansion with my children. And I'll travel abroad. And I won't give two shits. I'll be completely off grid. Um, and I'll be on the cover of magazines. Then you won't call me an Afri Forum this and that and I rob her off this and that and I sell out and I suffer from self-hate and I hate black people. I'll disappear. But I'm trying every day to educate and empower and uplift. Because I also understand this. This is now a message probably for white Indian, arguably colored people in South Africa. Now nah, let's exclude colored. White and Indian. If we do not actively in this country try and help black South Africans. Number one, we don't get more taxpayers, which means the burden of tax falls on whites and Indians and some of the uppity blacks. So number one, we want to share the tax burden. Number two, we miss out on so much talent because there are many talented black people beyond colored people like Trevor Noah and black people like Black Coffee and Tusom Beru. There are so many black people that can ignite this country and build amazing businesses. I mean, you've got Theo Baloy from Batu, you've got Likau from Trip, you've got to Makosa, um, Ubanu Putilo, shit. The... I have to say his name, sorry, now that I've mentioned Makosa. I don't know how the fuck his name just slipped me. Makosa. Founder. Latuma. Fuck. We've got talented black people that can actually go out into the world and bring in foreign currency and help make this country better. But at the lowest level, if white people and well off Indian people and some of the well off colored and Indian and black people are not going to invest in black people in this country, you are. <laughs> You are creating monsters. You are creating criminals. Because once the black masses in this country can no longer be pacified through social grants, once we can no longer ring fence them in townships, they will spread like a virus into townships and suburbia. And they will become so desperate that they will break into your home, steal your car, and because their minds are fucked and probably drugged up on booze and nyaupe, they will rape your children, rape your daughters, your wives, your sisters, your aunts, your grandmothers. There will be complete destruction and we will be forced, those of us who are better off, to maybe enforce the army, the police to, to harm these people when we could have avoided all of this. 
I think it's one of the reasons why I get so upset with our political leaders because they're not even trying to uplift the masses. They want to pacify them and they're hoping that it's good enough as long as they retain their privilege and as long as they are serving the West and as long as they're serving parts of the East. Anyways, my video was to say the two things. These fucking birds. Why do I always have birds making noise in the background? Fucking bombing my videos. The first part was understanding first, second, third world countries and that we need to move away from that thinking and move from developing to developed nations. And in South Africa, you can actually split because we've got developed neighborhoods and undeveloped and underdeveloped neighborhoods. And those offer opportunities for innovators, entrepreneurs, inventors, etc. The more important thing was me trying to say this. Black people in this country do not deserve to live in a good country. Number one, because they keep voting for politicians that refuse to live in black spaces, that refuse to develop black spaces, and that work as caretakers for minority capital in this country and for foreign capital interests in this country. And most importantly for accountability, black South Africans, including colored, refuse to buy from black businesses and refuse to work for black businesses. They refuse to pay for their TV license. Yes, they don't have money. You don't have money because you don't buy in your own people. They refuse to pay TV license, so they don't even deserve to have TV and radio. I actually wish it could fucking collapse. They refuse to pay for electricity, basic services. And then we wonder why there's load shedding. Go look at the data. Places like Alexandra in, in Johannesburg. I think over 65% of the people there are illegally connected. Do the same for Soweto. Do the same for places like Guamash and Umlazi. Do the same for places like Mtansane, Ezwite. The whole Pai uh, township. Um, look at places like Nyanga, Langa, Kukule, Tukailicha. Can go anywhere, boy. Illegal connections, and then we we'll wonder why we have load shedding. Well, there's many reasons why we have load shedding, but that's one of them. Until black people in this country take accountability, until some of us who are better off are willing to actually help fix this country and uplift it, the country will co continue to collapse and decay. And by the time we are victims of crime, by the time things get really bad and maybe the grid collapses, it will be too late and not all of us will be able to escape. Some of us are going to be stuck here and other nations will not be comfortable to take us in. And your favorite politicians that you defend to death on Twitter, they will leave. The same way they left the township to live in white suburbia, places that are run by the DA. When this country collapses, you best believe they will leave and go to some of their friends overseas. The same way people like Robert Mugabe, when he was ill, would go overseas for medical attention. People like the ex-deputy president Titi Mabuza, when he was ill, would go to places like Russia for medical attention. Your political leaders are not for you. Your business leaders, black business leaders, are not for you. And a whole lot of other people are focused on their own communities. You need to begin identifying black, white, colored, Indian, politicians, business people, social activists who actually care about you, who are going out of their way to educate you, going out of their way to upskill you, going out of their way to share resources so that you can learn to make your own money online and otherwise, going out of their way to market local businesses that pay tax locally and keep money locally, and people that actually are investing in your communities, your employers, the people that pay tax, the people that are actually volunteering in your spaces to make them better. And then you need to fucking catch a wake up, put your hand up, volunteer, pick up the litter in your neighborhood, do neighborhood watch, neighborhood patrol. Create WhatsApp groups or join WhatsApp groups for your community to uplift it and save yourself. No one is coming to save you. And people like myself are actually starting to get tired of trying to help people that are hell-bent on self-oppression. And soon, I mean, Vusit Mbwai identifies Dubai now as his home. Some of us might leave. Tutuzane Zuma at some point was based in Dubai. Other people are moving abroad. White, colored, Indian, black. I think Black Coffee's got a home in Los Angeles. Trevor Noah might have a home in LA, I think in New York, maybe. Some of us are going to leave. And you guys will be left alone. And South Africa will become a big township. And your economy, just like the township economy, will not be run by locals. It will be run by foreigners. 
and you guys will be left suffering on your own i think that's my message for today let me go and uh, enjoy my meetings in durban um always a pleasure to be in durban i appreciate the city so much and i'm sad that so many people have dropped the ball here in particular the anc leadership some of the parts of durban are becoming very dirty there's a lot of crime i know there was someone i was in mshanga last year when someone was gunned down probably like a kilometer from where i was based um if we don't catch a wake up and fix this country nothing's going to change and this includes having a very uncomfortable conversation about illegal foreigners and either ensuring that we document them aggressively so we can track their whereabouts or deporting and getting rid of them we we have to love our country otherwise our country will collapse and sooner rather than later maybe a township is actually even generous south africa will turn into a squatter camp into an informal settlement and that's where we'll go from here pin you all the black pen love you very much i believe in you and i hope that you believe in yourself and you will put in the work to make today a great day pen elimnyama iswar pen cheers